an original MCM production. Everybody, this is our second of, um, of of two authors. I mean, second of three authors that we're bringing in for a community panel discussion, and also then for the author talk that is after this at Boswell Books tonight at seven o'clock, and next Sunday is, we're having Heather Ann Thompson here, who just wrote, just been awarded a uh, Pulitzer for her book, Blood in the Water. And she will, we will be having those programs at Turner Hall um, on Sunday, the panel, and on Monday night in the Turner Ballroom. But welcome, These are, this is a program of the Milwaukee Turners that we're in collaborating with, the, um, with Boswell Books to bring in erudite, smart, and <laughs> <laughs> and great authors. Um, this is my daughter here, so I'm going on and on. <laughs> um, but all of them are wonderful. And, <laughs> and it's really, we think it's talking about bringing their expertise and their, and their, know, their knowledge um, and their thinking um, to very important, very important subjects. And it's something that is um, uh, affecting all of us today in the United States of America, and we may not even realize how much and how deeply. So our mission is to half, to reduce by one half, the um, prison population in Wisconsin within 10 years. So if you want to join us, 2030. Hang, sign in and, and be a part of our, of our group and our movement. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, oh, welcome. My name is uh, Michael Morgan. I'm going to ask as your uh, moderator uh, here today, uh, and I'm going to get right to uh, our discussion. Our topic for discussion this afternoon is stroking racism for political power, what can be done. But I guess the real question is, what can be done to reverse the policies and practices that have been a major contributing factor in the growth uh, of the prison population in states like Wisconsin, particularly as it relates to African American and uh, Hispanics uh, around the country? Um, over the last 40 years, the prison population across the United States has simply uh, exploded. Uh, there were a little over 23,000 uh, inmates in Wisconsin's prison system at the end of uh, last year. Uh, that's the largest number since December 2007. And I did a look back uh, in uh, 1980, there were 4,000 uh, inmates in Wisconsin um, prison. So we've seen a, a significant increase. But what is so alarming is that about 40%, 40, 42% actually, of the state's popula prison population is African American. Um, and that is in contrast to the fact that African Americans constitute only 6.6% .6 of the Wisconsin population. So you can see it's a, a mass incarceration problem for the general population. It's a crisis for the African American uh, community for a variety, a variety of reasons, many of which we'll touch on here to do, today. But to give you further context, Wisconsin's black-white incarceration disparity rate is the second highest in the country. According to the Sentencing Project, 221 per 100,000 white Wisconsinites wind up behind bars. For Hispanics, the rate is 563. For African Americans, the number is 2,542. This afternoon's discussion is the beginning of an effort, as Julie literally pointed out, we're calling confronting mass incarceration. Our goal is to reduce the Wisconsin prison population by 50% by the year 2030. 
This gathering today is the second of three um, discussions we'll be sponsoring over the next uh, two weeks. We'll be talking about the challenges of reducing our prison population, but that's only a start, of course, right? Talking about the problem is not actually an equivalent to actually doing something about the problem. But our hope is that by convening these sessions, to deeply examine the genesis of this problem and to perhaps offer ideas for a way forward, we can begin to bring together groups and individuals to map a path through policy, politics, emotion, and racism, hopefully to get to a place where we're not looking up, we're not locking up so many poor and as I said, Hispanic and African Americans. This undoubtedly will be a long journey uh, because the issue is very complex. Um, in fact, if it was simple, we could uh, you know, do something tomorrow. It's not as simple as you know, releasing um, those nonviolent offenders, which a lot of folks you know, make it out to be. It's, it's, a, it's a lot more complex to that, than that. The complexity is because it has to do, the problem has to do with crime, punishment, poverty, education, history, prosecutorial discretion, medical health, sentencing, campaign financing, alternatives to incarceration, bail, inadequately compensated and effective defense bar, and then of course, politics. Today's panelists have uh, studied, written about, or been active um, in issues related to many of these uh, topics. They have graciously agreed to share their knowledge and experience with us today. So let's get them on, shall we? First, uh, Julili Kohler Hausman. She is a Milwaukee native, and as uh, so proudly pointed out by her mother, um, she grew up here in uh, Milwaukee. Uh, and she is the author of a compelling new book, Getting Tough, Welfare and Imprisonment in 1970s America, published by Princeton University Press. In that book, she explores, as the New York Times put it, what explains the shift in the United States towards a punitive conception of responsibility. <laughs> Dr. Husband and Kohler will talk more about that but more about her. She is an assistant professor of history at Cornell University and is currently a visiting fellow with the Warren Center at Harvard University. Dr. Kola Hausman has been awarded fellowships from the American Association of University Women, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Her writing has been published in, journal, in the uh, Journal of American History, the Journal of Social History, the Journal of Urban History, all appropriate in as much as he's a history professor, and the New York Times, and the edited collection of, the of a piece called Challenging the Prison Industrial Complex. Prior to entering academia, Dr. Kola Hausman spent six years organizing labor, welfare, and anti-poverty uh, issues. We also have today D.J. Hall, not D.J., but D. Middle initial J. Hall. She is a co-founder of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, along with her husband, Andy Hall. She joined the staff as managing editor in June 2015 and is now responsible for the center's daily news operations. Ms. Hall worked at the Wisconsin State Journal for 24 years as an editor and reporter, focusing on projects and investigations. She is a 1982 graduate of the Indiana University School of Journalism. Prior to her returning to her hometown, which is uh, Madison, she worked down in Arizona for the, uh, for eight years down in Arizona, for the uh, Arizona Republic newspaper in Phoenix, where she covered issues related to city government, schools, and the environment. During her 35-year history, I know she didn't look like she could have worked that long, but during her 35-year journalism career, Ms. Uh, Hall has won more than three dozen local, state, and, natural, uh, and national awards for her work, including an award, and I remember this, for the uh, 2001 State Journal investigation that uncovered a $4 million a year secret campaign machine operated by Wisconsin's top legislative leaders. So, welcome. Also with us uh, today is Fred Hall, Jr. Mr., uh, I'm sorry, Fred Royal, Jr. 
uh, not related to D-Hole. Um, Fred Royal Jr. Mr. Royal has been active in uh, community uh, advocacy throughout his career. He's well known in the community. Currently, he is the president of the Milwaukee branch of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mr. Royal has served on a number of boards, including the Milwaukee Area Technical College uh, Board, uh, the Social Development Commission Board. And in 2011, he was elected to the American Civil Liberties Union uh, Board. And then we have uh, Dr. Robert S. Smith, whom I just found out um, is uh, my, my soccer pal. We, his son and my grandson play in the same soccer club. We've <laughs> talked on numerous occasions and never made the connection. Never made the connection. Uh, Dr. Smith is the uh, Henry G. John Professor of History and Director of the Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach at Marquette University. He's the author of Race, Labor, and Civil Rights, Griggs v. Duke, Power, and Expansion of Equal Employment Opportunity. Dr. Smith's research and teaching interests consider the intersection of race and law. His current projects explore the relationship, and I can't wait to talk to him about this at the soccer match. He explores <laughs> the relationship between civil human rights attorneys in the United States and South Africa during the uh, latter stages of apartheid. He hails from Indianapolis, Indiana, and is the father of an awesome, very good uh, <laughs> soccer player, uh, Henderson Marcellus Smith. Thank you all for being here with us today. Let's give our uh, panelists. Now, this is intended to be a free-flowing uh, conversation, but we're going to start uh, our discussion with Dr. Kohler Hausman, whom I'd like to ask uh, 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 for her to talk to us about how we got to where we are with mass incarceration of so many uh, poor African-American, Hispanics uh, around the uh, country. Uh, and I ask you that question because there's some very, very good materials that you uh, pulled through your uh, book uh, that should help us get into this, this uh, discussion here today. So. All right, well, thank you all so much. I'm using this magic pod thing. Can everyone <laughs> yeah. hear me? OK. Um, it's, it's such an honor to be here and be in Milwaukee and talking about this work um, and to be have my, it's a little tense to have your mom and dad <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking about your academic work. But, uh, but, uh, but this is a real honor, and especially to be part of a panel with people whose work I really just admire so much. Um, I'm hoping that. We're going to spend the most, most of this time talking about the particular challenge of, of what it means to confront mass incarceration, particularly in Wisconsin right now. And, um, and what I'm going to do might seem like it is not helpful for that, but I actually think and hope it will be. I'm going to, I, I was actually going to talk, and this is an answer to, to, to your question, actually going to sort of take as a historian, it's sort of my job, I have to kind of, what I can offer is a sort of pa is the past, um, is a story about the past. But, but I wanted to use the history of the welfare queen um, as a way to talk about how history can illuminate the sort of power of political tropes and political narratives, especially when they are dependent on racist caricatures, on racialized caricatures, and how these things interact with criminalization and play a really, really powerful role in defining social problems. And through defining social problems, constraining the way the solution that are, that are available to us. Because I think right now we're in, a, we're in a couple of struggles. We're recognizing that there's a crisis, but there's a struggle happening politically and socially over how to understand this problem. Right. Um, and I think that the period that I study in the 70s is really, a, there's, a, in, there's some similarities there. There was unquestionably a huge amount of upheaval and change, but, and people agreed that there was a problem, but there was really profound struggle over what the nature of that problem was and what were the solutions that were appropriate. Um, so I'm going to use the welfare queen because in a sense I want to talk about criminalization and it is not something that we all, um, and the welfare queen, the politics around the welfare queen criminalize things that I think we still don't all assume should be criminalized. And, and it's easier to talk about the process of criminalization, I think, if you use something that we don't sort of assume is a, that we, we've, we haven't already really settled into understanding is a problem that should be handled 
through crime, through policing, through punishment, through courts, you know, that, that, and, um, and really we sort of understand these, these assumptions about what's a crime and who, who, and how we respond to these things as really historical processes, you know, and certain things as we know about, you know, prohibition, like move in and out of the category of crime, and there's, that's really a process. Um, so I'm going to talk about the welfare, cro I mean, the welfare queen, but really these tropes, this, I think this, it's a, Equally as important to think about to think about these, for instance, when we talk about voter fraud, or the, the fact that the wall is a you know would be a solution to to sort of anxieties about immigration, or to debates about the current opioid ep epidemic. But particularly understanding that, for instance, getting tough is the way to handle the cluster of of um, of problems that uh, that that we. Um, that are currently sort of looked to the penal system to handling. So I became interested in the, I had a section where I was gonna define welfare, but I think we all know what that is. I, the welfare queen. It's the, you, there's there's when I teach this to undergrads, people don't remember the welfare queen because she's because I think she was this huge character in post-war politics, but post 19 you know 1996 and Clinton's welfare reform, she really you know still shapes political understandings, but really recedes from um, a, a lot of the the tropes in the same way. Um, but I became interested in all these issues when I was working on the reauthorization of Clinton's 1996 welfare bill, and it became clear that legislators and, and what and I was dealing with. Legislators, and I was. It became clear that we were legislating against this, like phantom, this this caricature, that this fund. What I think is sort of non-debatably this racist lie, um, which which was the welfare queen. This notion that women on welfare were lazy and cheaters to the point of being sort of criminal. Um, and, and critically, as if we're trying to understand the development of narratives about crime in, in US politics, critically responsible for criminals, right? The welfare recipients were often understood as be held responsible for rate for for criminal for ch crim criminal for like criminal children. I mean this very sort of insidious way, that's the way the discourse worked. Um, and this, the, the, this trope was so powerful that it was really painful to even bring welfare recipients and politicians together because to have to make welfare recipients construct, to, to force them to have to construct and counter some of these narratives was really quite a, um, was, a was a pretty intense uh, and often, and sometimes since it often felt fruitless, it was a really sort of, it was a sort of disturbing project. So, um, but it was through this that I became convinced that we need to really confront political tropes and scripts and political narratives that are circulating, that we can't just, that, that facts are important and reports are important, but that we need to sort of directly name and confront how these things operate. So. That's what I want to sort of really quickly sort of tell the story of where how, how, the story that I discovered of how the welfare queen came to be, um, and to, to sort of illustrate the way that criminalization and sort of racialized tropes produced understandings about broader social problems and how important it is to acknowledge that that's happening. Um, so the welfare queen grew out of the welfare crisis of the 1970s. And during this period, there was a whole host of new legal decisions and actual legal organizing that actually opened up welfare benefits for the first time to a huge group of people who had actually been barred from getting them, over, especially African Americans in the South, but actually a lot of people in, the, uh, in, other, in, um, in other areas. And so this, and then, and, and this change happened at the same time that there was massive economic changes, and it created a swell, a big swelling in the um, number of people receiving public assistance. Then, and, and so, so these are the, so this is the point that I want to make, is that then there becomes this fierce contestation about what kind of problem this is. Is, a lot of people were saying there is no problem. I mean, yes, it's expensive, we need to figure out a way to pay for this, but people are finally getting the majority of the people who are eligible for a, pro for a program are now getting the services to which they are entitled. Some people said, yeah, there's a problem. These, these services are actually not, they're, they're, they're not significant. They don't give me enough money to support my family in a way that I think, it, you know, is, I would, that I think is fair. But, um, but the, and then, and then other people said, okay, here's what we do. We're going to cut the, we're going to cut everyone's benefit by like a certain percent. And then President Nixon, a Republican president, his answer was, let's replace the whole program and institute a guaranteed minimum income. Like every person in the country is going to get, I mean, every family in the country would have a guaranteed minimum, minimum income, the family assistance plan. Kind of unthinkable in today's political world, but that was one of the many solutions that were sort of being circulated for the welfare crisis. The answer, the, the sort of solution that ended up winning out um, was forwarded by a little known politician who was then governor of California, um, Ronald Reagan, 
And he, his solution to the sort of welfare mess was actually an argument about what had caused it, which is that it had been caused by an influx of ineligible and undeserving cheaters, that it was actually a function of fraud, of, wel of, of, welfare, of welfare fraud, of people getting benefits to which they were not entitled. And, um, and this is critical, because there was a lot of people that were, that were saying, because of the, because benefits weren't adjusted for inflation, because of the economic changes, and because of the incredible inflation, people can't, li there really isn't a way to li live on the amount of money that people are getting on, on welfare. Well, so, so and, and politicians, you, I find this, they, they say this in like meetings, you know, they're like, well, honestly, how could, <laughs> it's like, how could people not be trying to get extra money, you know? So but the solution, of course, in this situation that is forwarded by California and then duplicated across the state is actually high profile purges, criminal, really criminalization of welfare fraud. So a whole series of things that had, would in the past be handled, for instance, bureaucratically. A lot of times there were people who were really confused about the, about the regulations, so they, so they were sort of administrative mistakes, so they would get, you know, would just be, the grant would just be adjusted. In, in this new situation, those people would, for instance, be referred to a district attorney for prosecution. So there was a whole set of like very ho high profile um, groups and they, rec they in in increased the penalties for welfare fraud. They, um, they, sorry, I'm like way off from what I'm saying here. They, um, <laughs> they, uh, they instituted new surveillance. They actually considered in 1975 in California fingerprinting every person on welfare. There was an intense, like, bring, importing criminal justice strategies into the welfare system. Um, they offered, they considered offering bounties, like actual bounties to, um, to anyone who reported, who turned in people with, um, uh, who turned in people that were um, supposedly committing welfare fraud. And, and then Ronald Reagan took this story of the welfare queen, this Chicago woman who had allegedly 25 husbands, 17 different Cadillacs, lots of homes in, you know, many wigs that she was sort of this shapeshifter character, this, this woman, Linda Taylor, who for a long time everyone assumed was totally a fabrication, but turns out was actually like, Anyway, I don't, the story's bananas and I'd love to tell you. It's like the, cra it's the craziest story. But the point is he took this story about this one person and he told this story of the welfare queen at every stop that he would make on his political things and he would tell her as a sort of representative, well, he used this person to stand in for people on, um, on public assistance. Um, and the key here that I'm trying to make and why I sort of the long walk to get to my sort of closing points here is that the, this, these claims and their sort of success of this narrative explanation, you know, this narrative way of result of, of explaining, um, of, uh, of explaining this sort of social and political issue or problem, if you want to call it that, it rested on very particularly politically resonant um, images, I don't want to say old as if they had stopped, of images of black mothers, um, about assumptions about black women's sexuality, about illeg like the illeg illegitimate claims of black women's cl um, claims on the state, and, um, and, uh, and of course, a particular hostility that African American women were gaining access to services, or, or, or the services for the first time, but also the right, for instance, claiming the right in public to, to parent their children, a right that white middle class women had actually long had, but sort of saying that, but also saying that this was a, forwarding this right um, for other populations. So, um, and, and what I'm suggesting is that it was the particular, it was the way in which this trope rested on race, you know, like a, like a long tradition of deep racial um, assumptions that it made it particularly resonant. Uh, and that it also became a lightning rod for deep frustration that was going on for massive economic social change, which was a huge numbers of women in all walks of life were being pushed or choosing to move into the workforce. And this was creating a massive sort of rearrangement of social and work and social responsibilities and really profound social change. So, so, so but welfare became sort of the lightning rod to organize a lot of these frustrations. And, um, and the criminalization of, of, the, of the welfare queen and of welfare um, obviously stoked racism, but it also helped define 
the problem, right? It also helped make sense of expanding poverty and welfare costs um, with an explanation of individual pathology. So, it, so eliding the profound economic transformations of the period, and it really directed political host hostility toward women on welfare and helped advance a particular interpretation of social disorder during a period when really it was fiercely contested. Like this was a moment where there was actually incredible consternation about, I mean, a, a incredibly, um, a lot of different, um, interpretations of why there was poverty in the United States and why it was constrained in certain places. So, um, so if so, and, and most important, it crowded out the voices of a, of a sort of very vibrant welfare rights movement and the, the voice of poor women themselves who were advocating for their own vision of how to move forward. Um, so, so when I think about this question, which is about a path forward from around this particular issue of mass incarceration. Um, first of all, historians usually run for the hills when, <laughs> when we're asked to sort of, uh, it's like a quick way to get fired. Um, but the, because um, we're all, usually because we're wrong, because it's like predicting or like prescribing, right? It's like you're usually wrong. And, um, but, but I do think that we want to confront the sort of unique and profound roles of political narratives in producing popular understandings about our world, meaning that we are, that the particular way that we define the problem of mass incarceration, right. the causes, um, if we think about the, you know, for instance, we think about the problem, you mentioned this, of, of mass incarceration as a problem of nonviolent drug offenders, right. you know, we're sort of misunderstanding, um, we're pro in some ways we're misunderstanding the problem and we're also gonna have a tough path moving forward. So I think we need to pay attention to the narratives, but we also need to understand how profoundly powerful um, and long and deep seated these explanations relying on racial and gender hierarchy are, how resonant those particular arguments are, particularly the criminalization of blackness, and, and that therefore that to counter those narratives we need, I think there needs to be direct confrontation, but there also needs to be attention to advancing powerful alternative explanations that resonate, um, that, that resonate broadly. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, my hunch from the history, and I, I think this is where we should, everyone else's um, expertise is going to be so valuable. My hunch is from the history is that the struggle going forward is not just countering tropes with moral suasion or statistics, but really requires organizing and mobilizing politically at many levels and in many spheres and sort of realizing that there has to be sort of a really profound multi-pronged um, approach. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Dee, I'm going to bring you into the discussion because you said something in, a, in an earlier conversation that kind of picks up on uh, some of the things that uh, Dr. Uh, Kola Hausman was talking about. How we characterize a problem sometime kind of drives the way we address the problem, right? For example, you gave the uh, example of uh, we had a crack epidemic, and that was a criminal problem, right? We had to go out there and get those people. It wasn't about, you know, a rehabilitative or a therapeutic approach. Um, it was, you know, let's criminalize anyone who's uh, related to the problem. Fast forward a few years later, we have an opioid problem. And lo and behold, the opioid problem is largely uh, involving whites, uh, and it's a therapeutic response in terms of how we, how we get at this uh, problem. Um, I think it's... Uh, it uh, sort of um, um, brings to light in recent terms what Dr. Kola Hausman has just talked about. So maybe you could talk a little bit about over the last 20 years or so of your reporting in the criminal justice system, how you see this problem uh, evolving and uh, any thoughts on how, you, uh, how we might want to uh, approach strategies to, to get at our objective. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, for mentioning that anecdote because I think that is exactly what we're dealing with. And I like the notion of talking about the welfare queen who turns out was uh, actually involved in a, a whole bunch of other stuff and, and, you know, welfare cheating was just a small part of her enterprise apparently. And, she was, and, and, and you know, it's just a different you know, way of looking at it. But, it. but it is true that people glom onto stories. That's what journalism is, right? We're stories. We use data, we use events, you know, description, but it's stories. And, what, and the story of the crack epidemic was a story that did not resonate with the people who were running the world, including our country, because those weren't their people, right? Those were somebody else's people. They were in that neighborhood over there. Uh, and so we need to just confine and contain those people and punish those people, whereas now you fast forward and we have, you know, the president on down talking about this opioid crisis, which I, 
dare say, is probably about in the same category, perhaps, as the crack epidemic. I don't know that you know, for sure, but the way we're looking at it is completely different. Yeah. Um, and the way I think about it, too, um, is if you go back to um, back in the mid '90s, remember the super predator kids? They were just they were just like animals, and so you had to lower the age at which you sent children to adult prisons because they were just so bad and and they couldn't be redeemed. And so right about that time, Wisconsin started sending all of its 17 year olds to the criminal justice system. Right. So that's another reason that the numbers are up. It's not the main reason, but it's a reason. So we started viewing children. Uh, whose brains we now know aren't fully developed at that age, um, in, in viewing them as adult, you know, irredeemable predators. Now, that what's interesting in that regard, we've actually seen in the last couple of legislative sessions, there have actually been bipartisan bills introduced to, to bring us back to the old system, where you're an 18-year-old is when you're an adult. Um, and, and I find that interesting, and I think a lot of that has to do with the growing realization that these, uh, these folks are just not, their brains are not fully developed, their behaviors are not fully developed. Um, but that, that's taken a long time. I'm talking 20 years. It's taken us 20 years to start to figure this out, and it still hasn't changed. It's still the same. We still send 17-year-olds to the adult system. And then you fast forward to 1999 with Truth and Sentencing. Again, um, that was brought on by people being very upset about the fact that a person would be sentenced to 40 years in prison and within 10 years they would be out because we had that's the system we had. It led to a lot of misunderstanding, people feeling like we weren't tough enough on crime. This was also at a time where crime was still pretty bad, not as bad as it was in the 90s, but people were kind of tired of crime and they felt misled when people would be given a long, long sentence, like a life sentence, and they would actually get out you know, in 20 years or something like that. So. So what's happened is we have truth in sentencing, and as a result, we have many, many thousands of more people in prison, and they're there for longer. So that's another issue that we have that's particular to Wisconsin in the, in the sense that we called it truth in sentencing. It was probably called something similar elsewhere. But this has been a national phenomenon, too. You know, We have more people incarcerated, I think, per person than almost any country in the world. So this is something that has caught on, not just here. We weren't the first ones to think about locking everyone up, but uh, we are part of a large nationwide trend. And so we have just this extraordinary number of people who are incarcerated. And then this seems like a not related issue, but it really is. So we also have a very large disenfranchisement of people who are convicted felons. So they cannot vote until they're completely done with their supervision by the Department of Corrections. This can last for decades. It can basically take all of the years that you would have been voting, you're just not voting. And any time a group of people do not have the vote, they do not have power. They don't, politicians don't listen to them. We write a lot about things like solitary confinement and lack of parole. That's another issue I'll mention in a minute. Um, and you know, it doesn't resonate that much with policymakers, to be honest, because these are not people they ever have to worry about casting a vote against them because they can't vote. And Wisconsin has one of the highest disenfranchisement, uh, um, you know, ratios in the nation. Not the highest. Some places, if you're ever convicted of a felony, you are always barred from voting for the rest of your life. We are not that bad. We're not that restrictive. But we do severely restrict the voting rights of anybody who's been uh, convicted of a felony, and when you have the racial disparities that were just mentioned earlier, that effect then falls disproportionately on communities of color. So that's another thing to think about, is you are taking away the political power of a very large group of people, and the efforts by you know, uh, dem primarily Democrats to re-enfranchise felons has been largely unsuccessful. Um, even Democrats, frankly, are not willing to stick up for felons. It's, it's just not a popular constituency, and again, it's one that doesn't have any power right now. Um, so the other issue that I see leading to the large numbers that we have in prison is the parole system has really, really almost ground to a halt. Um, there are very, very few of these so-called old law prisoners who were sentenced before 1999. You know, there are several thousand who apparently are eligible for parole, and they can't seem to get out. And 
generally the reason given is they have not served enough time, which is a naturally subjective decision. Um, but it's kind of a catch-all that's used in a lot of cases. And some of the cases that I've written about, people are already working on the local, you know, grounds crew landscaping of a community in the area. You know, they're getting nominal supervision. Obviously, they're not considered to be that dangerous. They're not a flight risk. No one's worried about public safety there. But suddenly, if they were to actually go out and be able to live their own life outside of the Department of Corrections, outside of a prison, that they that's just not acceptable. So it, it's confusing to me because I think, you know, that it, public safety seems to be just sort of a, a term. It's not really in effect for those, those folks. It's not a, a real concern. Um, so those are some of the big trends I see that have happened in Wisconsin in the past, you know, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years that are really raising the rate. Um, the, I guess another big one is the proportion of people who get returned to prison for violating probation and parole rules. Um, that's a very large number of people. Um, and, you know, it, it, all of this could be changed. So that, I mean, I guess that's the positive. If you're looking for change, all of this stuff could be changed. You know, Minnesota has a fraction of the number of people that we have in prison. Why? I mean, their demographics are pretty similar, population's pretty similar in many ways, but their policies are different. And so that, that's something to think about, is this, a lot of this is within our control. Uh, only that you have to have top, you know, people who are in charge really caring about this. And right now this is a pretty uh, voiceless group of constituents who are never going to, or may, may never vote, or, or may vote years from now. Uh, and so they lack the political kind of power to affect change as, as an interest group. So those are the things I'm seeing. You know, Dr. Smith, maybe I can ask you to comment um, uh, on another complexity that we have going forward. And that is that, um, and you mentioned this to me also, um, the criminal, uh, I mean, the uh, legal system um, has historically shaped African Americans uh, in a, a certain kind of way in a look in, a, in, uh, in, in, in defining who they are and their rights and responsibilities, that sort of thing. Maybe you can comment a little bit on yeah, that. Yeah, gladly. I, I want to thank everybody and thank the panelists. Um, you know, when, you, when you're able to listen to your, your panelists, you're able to then add some more girth to your comment. I want to just share some of the terms that our panelists have used to talk about the, the political struggles associated with criminalization. We, we're using words like phantom, caricature, super predator, pathological, uh, scapegoating. There was a, a great coupling of words, confine and contain. There's almost no era in American history where that same <laughs> set of attitudes uh, weren't directed toward black people. <clears throat> In fact, if we really want to see the genesis of this, we have to go back to the moment that most of us know is the most challenging era to talk about, and that's American slavery. If we look at slave codes, if we look at the burgeoning of the United States and what becomes the United States, you see the same type of fears built into that system, a system that makes it illegal for a human being to do the most natural thing, that natural thing, that, that natural right that leads to the formation of this country, which is to seek one's freedom. That becomes a crime. It becomes a crime for individuals who are enslaved, overwhelmingly black people, to then do these natural occurring efforts without being looked upon as criminal. It, it, it's, it's a part it's deeply woven in the American legal system to think about blackness and criminality in the same context. And then even with moments of reform, like Reconstruction, probably the single most important moment of reform in the country, because of the, the, the ways in which millions of people are then beginning to exercise that freedom, in this moment of reform, we all know the phrase, accept as punishment for a crime. Mm -hmm. Somehow or another, and we know how, and we know another, somehow <laughs> or another, this moment of massive reform 
bends back toward black criminality, <clears throat> such that the very act of being a free person is codified as criminal in black codes in 1865, the very same year the 13th Amendment is ratified. And despite the, the protections, the, the, the benefits associated with equal protection and due process that become uh, codified and protected in the 14th Amendment, that moment of reform still continually advances these notions of black criminality, almost in this, using the same attitudes and rhetoric that we're talking about in the post-1965 era. And so even with moments of reform, we see this effort to bring folks who are attempting to exercise some basic principles of citizenship to move these folks back into the lens of being criminal, of criminalizing behaviors. And what I'd like to provide, you know, there, there and I, I wish I could take credit for this. Now, let me be honest with you. Mm -hmm. We're scholars, so, you know, we have to give our credit. There's one particular book that opened this conversation up to me in very <coughs> clear and in meaningful ways. And there's, he's, he's since passed, but uh, Judge Aileen Higginbotham, hmm. a civil rights stalwart, uh, wrote this beautiful book called In the Matter of Color. And it's the American legal process. As, a, as, as it pertains to colonial America. It's that book that explains today more clearly for me than any other piece out there. Because what, what Judge Higginbotham clearly explains is that law is a function of ideology. Mm -hmm. Law is a function of the ideology of the lawmakers. Law is a function of, of, of the attitudes of the lawmakers. Law teaches us who's entitled to certain benefits of law. And, who, and those who are outside of the bounds of those benefits. And so it, it's, it's critical that we always come back to this longer, broader examination of these connections associated with black criminality in our legal system. It's, it's written right in our policies. It's written in our constitution. Our constitution makes it a crime at a particular point for folks to attempt to abscond from slavery. It's, it's right there for us. We can look for it, we can find it. And again, in these moments of reform, I, I wanted to add one more comment to um, our esteemed colleagues here. It, if we go back to the 80s and 90s, crime was certainly the, uh, one of the core um, political tools that politicians had to use to win races, right? And there was another one. You all remember affirmative action? And if we even go back to this particular set of policies that was designed overwhelmingly to <coughs> provide people equal employment, what was the rhetoric? What was the attitude that was cultivated as a function of, a, of opposition to fair employment? Folks were undeserving, right? They were taking jobs. Even in that particular political debate, notions of criminality seep in. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave with, the, I'll, I'll stop with this one last comment. I can't remember the case, um, but uh, future Chief Justice William Rehnquist, <laughs> right? Is Shorewood grad, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, God, he writes in a dissent to a significant set of fair employment uh, policies that he can't see robbing Peter <laughs> to pay Paul. Now, Pastor, I'm going to need you to work with me on Peter and Paul in that story. <laughs> <laughs> but even our own future chief justice begins to write black criminality into notions associated with fair employment. We have a bigger problem. And we need this multi-pronged approach. Because as, as I was talking to our colleague here uh, earlier, it's really hard to unscramble an omelet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Royal, uh, speaking of, uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations um, that have been involved in the human rights, civil rights struggle on behalf of, organ of uh, African Americans in America since the uh, beginning of the last century, the NAACP has been there, NAACP has been there. And in terms of bending the law, we have a new movie now um, uh, characterizing all the great work of what uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall did. I'm wondering if you could comment just a little bit on what role you see uh, for the local and national NAACP in trying to resolve this you know, horrendous uh, scourge that we have? Uh, certainly. Um, 
One of the front doors to the penal system is our contact with our local law enforcement. Uh, the Department of Justice just released their uh, draft of the Voluntary mm -hmm. Compliance Review with the Morgan Police Department. And in the findings, they showed that our police department lacked legitimacy and procedural justice. And legitimacy and procedural justice means that the community sees what the police department does as being lawful and legal, right? So that if I have a law infraction, I am detained, stopped, and or interrogated because of that infraction, not because the color is my skin, or because of the high crime area in which I live. Mm -hmm. But as we see in this latest uh, BBC documentary, uh, Dark States, That's one of them. Uh, Guns in Milwaukee, yeah. our police department pretextually stops anybody of color because they believe they are a potential suspect. Mm -hmm. So that brings the, uh, to the community the point of is one, our police department legitimate? And then two, is there procedural justice that's applied across every community in which the police department polices? So if you want to reduce the amount of folks going into incarceration, as what was highlighted in the ACLU study on incarceration for low marijuana use or possession. African Americans were charged and convicted seven times more or higher than European Americans, even though the drug rate usage is the same. So if, if we don't start on how or stop locally on how our police police us, uh, then we'll never get an inroads into that mass incarceration pipeline. And then point two, during this whole opioid epidemic, there was a piece on about this Massachusetts school system that had this sixth grade class with three overdoses. So little Johnny and Janie were acting out. They were showing uh, moments of anger. So they brought in psychologists and, 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 and uh, counselors, gave them timeout rooms to find out what was wrong with Johnny and Susie, and then give them support. But we have 743 shootings in this city and they pinned MPS with nothing. Right now they're going through uh, trauma-informed awareness. So that when you see our children acting out, at least you know they're acting out. But there's no support services for that. There's no, there's no mechanism in place to give these children a healthy chance to continue their education, to be productive citizens. No. By the third grade, their discipline level is when they start building prisons. So if we don't address that on the front end, we're not going to make inroads on the back end. Those two, those two initial pipelines, in my opinion, is where the NAACP fight is currently for the 21st century. I think that uh, police community relations is the civil rights issue of this century. Thank you. I'm going to open up uh, for questions from the audience now. And I see there are a lot of folks who want to jump in. I'm going to just ask that you push your little um, button on your device to make sure that you're being heard and go right ahead. We'll start with you. Good afternoon. Thank you guys. This was um, all of the panelists. This is uh, very enlightening. Um, so uh, I just had a question in terms of uh, Dr. Kohler Hausman. Um, uh, that was, I think, a really great way to start us off talking about the na a narrative and then how that frame subsequent um, solutions that are that are explored um, and in the, everything that we've discussed here opiate versus crack crack versus cocaine when you talk about the federal sentencing guidelines right Absolutely. I mean we can do that we're talking about effects that all have the same root cause which dr. Smith to your point goes back to slavery, the thing, the elephant in the room that we as a country still wrestle with, and it's just this cancer that continues to eat away at us. Because um, 
people who are blacks in particular, and anyone, and I say blacks in particular, because even uh, people of color from other places, when they come to the United States, they get the message loud and clear. If you want to survive and come up, do not associate with black people. <laughs> That's the last thing you need to do, right? So black people are still denied their full humanity. And without being afforded full humanity, there is no empathy. And without empathy, uh, uh, it, it, it isn't a public health problem, it's a nuisance to be eradicated, right? And so you can't have, you, the, the, what is just doesn't apply to something that's not familiar. And we need empathy for it to be familiar and we, we, can, we can hardly have that in any way if, if black people because of the things we still haven't dealt with still are not seen as having the full capacity to be in pursuit of life liberty and justice right so how do we because again it, you know this transcends all of all of these things obviously right i'm not saying anything that everyone here doesn't already know so it in in all these different corners you know what can we do to 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 get at what is really at the heart of the matter on these things and i i'm asking that genuinely I mean. well open up mr mr royal yeah let me let me take a shot at that um, and this is very broad strokes because we brought in dr joy de Grulier, who talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome and the pathologies that are associated with slavery aren't ours to own. They're European American. Yeah. For a group of individuals to sit around and passively watch people get burned, mutilated, cut, have those pieces cut up, taken home, and put on mantles as souvenirs, and then to go to church and have that abstention, that's the pathologic that has that pathology that has to be dealt with. That's not ours to own. We're, we're here trying to be as civil and engaged in this country as we can. But when you see racism at that level, and our, our new sitting 45th has allowed that to rise back to the surface, that's what has to be dealt with before we, could, we as a country, that all pledge allegiance to the red, white, and blue, right? Until we can truly hold to that creed, that has to be dealt with and owned by European Americans. I wanted to stick up for the power of story uh, because you talked about the welfare queen and the story of the welfare queen and how that resonated. And the problem there was framed as, uh, you know, pe undeserving people getting benefits. What if they framed the problem as too many poor people because we don't have enough good jobs for people? What would the solution have been then? <laughs> would it have been some demonization of this semi-fictional character from Chicago? Or would it have been maybe a way of getting more people self-sufficient, uh, making a better economy for the people who live here? So the power of story is that you have to try to replace those stories with stories of the people that you actually know the people, real people, not just caricatures or uh, phantoms, you know, figments of people's various political imaginations, but real people. And so when I, I've talked to a group called Wisdom, I don't know if anybody here is a member of Wisdom, um, I've talked to them in the past about, they've asked how do we get our stories out, or how do we get information out to the public, how can we be successful, and I always say, you have to tell a story about real people. Um, and, and it can't be so big and overwhelming and like everything's bad and everything's wrong, but people start to, they, they make connections with real people and real people's stories and their struggles. Now, I will say though that among demonized people in this country are inmates of every, of every color. Uh, they are just, uh, they are just uh, demonized. And so that is a struggle, that, that is a big struggle, but that's one way to replace the one image is is to groups that can bring this other image of real people. The power is, of story is good, but, but then when I'm reading a story, the real people I imagine may only look one way. 
Right? It, so, so it might well, be. Right back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm actually thinking about actual real people that you'd actually talk about. You know, this this person who some aspects of this existed. Um, you know, you, you would tell real people's stories who have, uh, you know, not just a general story, but a real story. But that that's just one way. There's a lot more problems to be solved, but that's you know, one way to do it. It seems to me that there, there are examples in American history where we have, meaning African Americans have, been able to frame the narrative and tell our story. And probably the most celebrated is Dr. King, the genius of nonviolence, right? The aggressive, over sex, uh, aggressive male, right, was seen on TV, and they intentionally framed these marches to get TV to tell these stories to white Americans through their television sets, right, demonstrating clearly that, hey, we're not the aggressor, we're the victim here. We're fighting for our rights, right? And clearly shown to them, uh, to all America, who the aggressors were. There were Bull Connor, there were George Wallace, right? Any number. And we saw some changes as a result of that. So there is power in the uh, story. The real question is, we're dealing with a marginalized group here, right? Who may not, we're gonna have to be real creative about telling the story and having that story being embraced by enough uh, the discrete constituencies, right, who have enough uh, to uh, coalesce enough political power to get the change that we need, right? I'm not certain, Dr. Royal, how you get all of white America on a couch well, to help them to understand. Well, 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 thank you, you know, we tried that. The doctor, but here, uh, I'm here's sorry, the Mr. Thing. Royal. <laughs> uh, white America understood 2008 recession, right? When it impacted them on their front door and they were laid off looking for jobs. Right, white America got that. When their homes were being repossessed because mortgages were, were going under, right? Because the economic powers to be said, we're gonna make money off you too. We don't care about you either, right? So when we get that critical mass, as we are seeing in this opioid addiction, mm -hmm. that we don't wanna call heroin addicts, heroin addicts. Mm -hmm. When we get to that critical mass, they will come around to finding a, a, an alliance in commonality. You cannot spend more money on your prison system than your educational system and be competitive globally. Right. It's not a sustainable model. <laughs> you can't do it. So I agree. It's gonna come down to economics. Right now, I, the, the city of Milwaukee has the youngest potential yeah. workforce in the state. Mm. Now, if folks wanna be so racist that they will not increase their bottom line by utilizing this workforce, then they're going to suffer the loss. Economic, it's going to come down to economics. Right. And you know, we cross the education threshold, right? Oh, we, UW system, uh, we spend more on corrections in this state uh, than we do on our university system, which is It's, it's know, not going to be the couch, it's going to be that bank account. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're moving to uh, that kind of persuasion. Uh, yes, sir. And then the gentleman in the back. We're going to. He had his hands up first, sir. Yes, you. Thank you. Um, this question is for uh, Dr. Kohler Houseman and uh, to any of uh, the uh, panelists that they feel compelled to um, join in. So I want to. My question is in regards to what we're talking about um, in regards to caricatures, stories. So our, um, I'm a quarter way through your book, and as I was reading um, about, you know, a lot of the um, political rhetoric used um, in terms of. Um, you know, criminalizing um, brown, black and brown. Can I interrupt you for one moment? Is yeah. your phone near the mic? Oh, go ahead. Continue. Okay. All right. So, um, in regards to caricatured uh, stories, um, you know, as I was, um, I made it through about a quarter of your book, and um, as you were um, writing about um, Nelson Rockefeller and um, how he was, um, you know, cracking down. Uh, supposedly on um, black and brown communities um, in regards to, um, you know, whether it's drugs, um, welfare fraud, and, um, you know, many other capacities. I was thinking about um, a lot of the films from uh, the 70s, um, you know, particularly um, films that focus on uh, police and uh, vigilantes. You think about Dirty Harry, you think about the Death Wish movies, you think about Fort Apache, the Bronx, the yeah. French Connection, so on and so forth. Um, and my question to you is, um, you know, as you were writing this book and conducting the research, um, you know, what were your observations in terms of the ways popular culture illustrates and amplifies uh, political rhetoric? 
my favorite question ever. I love that you just asked me that. So I don't. I could go on for hours. I actually have the. I have a paper about that I've written about um, the way that people used the the images of Vietnam, mm -hmm. the war at home, and the and and the war abroad, and that. In the 1970s, facing especially widespread urban rebellions, this notion that these were similar sets of spaces, insurgents, urban jungle, ju you know, d er, like an urban jungle, uh, the jungles of Vietnam, that these were similar spaces and that we would need similar techniques and sort of this rhetoric. And then this literally, I mean, what's amazing is this actually literally happened. We actually had, I'm getting the dirty hair. I know it seems crazy, but, um, but that we actually had counterinsurgency experts from Vietnam then would come home and advise police departments and be like, and then they remapped urban space. They like put numbers on top of housing, like of, of housing um, complexes so that helicopters could land in the middle. I mean, so there was really a remaking of urban space. But what's so interesting is it actually happened, those vigilante movies, those are almost all veterans. Right. These, these people that come home, this notion that you come home and you are now like sort of weapons trained, and uh, yeah. and that and that you and that the idea is that the problem at home is a problem that can be only solved mm -hmm. through this sort of vigilante violence. And that what's so fascinating, and that's that's Dirty Harry, that's Death Wish, that's this whole slew of like Vietnam era, <laughs> like um, that that somehow it's only this sort of hyper masculinist force, and right. it's a very sort of. It's you know typically sort of this sort of white military masculinity that is has to come back and sort of it's reestablished control and there's these interesting parallels between um, that that is saturates the 1970s. Yeah, that's how uh, Chief uh, William Parker ran the LAPD after he fought in World War II. It, exactly. So this the the notion and these crazy parallels between space between foreign wars and domestic space that you and this builds on the conversations that you would be able to imagine communities as not just foreign countries, but hostile yeah. war zones. I mean, and that's the rhetoric that's being used. And it continues through, definitely through the, you know, mm, like right. through, the, through the 90s and today. But it was very, I think it really had, Vietnam War really inflicted it in a really important way and heightened that. And you see those in those vigilante films. And the last thing I'll say is what those things were based on is this notion that like the state is impotent. The state can't do it. So like we need this sort of particular type of sort of military masculinity to sort of solve these problems and only and that's the only way that's going to be solved and that the st and that the state especially when they say the state's like social service it's the services like that is making the problem worse and we need this sort of vigilante violence because the state's not doing the job that's like those just runs through the political tropes and is represented in the video so i thank you for that question all right can i can i, can I just really quickly respond to that as well dante and yet somehow another a, militar, a militarized response to that reform era is eerily similar to the militarized response from Reconstruction. That they're, they're out of line. They're, they're acting crazy. It's probably just kill them. <laughs> All right, first you talked about the TV during the Civil Rights uh, era and how it got the story out there. Also, it got the shame out there, too. Everybody around the world say the United States got these so-called images. They want to go around the world. They want to make the world in their image. You Absolutely. know what I'm saying? But all the time at home, this is what you're doing to your own people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not only that, and then, right, people in the United States, they knew what was going on. They, all the white people here, they knew what was going on. They see it every day. We had, uh, uh, you, you drink over here, you black. You drink over here. I mean, you drink over here, you color. You drink over here, you white. You know what I'm saying? Just peer. So it ain't like they ain't know what's going on. It's like they know what's going on now. Uh, oh, yeah. And the thing that King used successfully was their own piece of paper, the Constitution, their own values. Men were created equal. That's what you said. Is that what, is, is that what it is or that's just on paper? So I'm saying if it wasn't for movements like the Civil Rights Movement, suffrage, I'm talking about the Constitution to be a dead letter. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So it's been Agreed. protests and everything else that adds spirit back to the letter of the Constitution. Every time. And, it, and, and every day, the country succumbed. It became better, so to say. Uh, I was watching a, uh, a, a, a conversation between the ex-police chief in Chicago and Common, the, the rapper. And the police chief was saying, look, everybody said he felt like he was a fall guy for whatever happened. Somebody got killed. 
and he 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 lost the job in the mayor. He said, I'm the fall guy. He said, the thing is, we the front line. We what you see. You know what I'm saying? But all the time, we under instruction. You know what I'm saying? We the front line. We what you see. But y'all don't never say nothing about the politicians who making the laws that we must enforce. You know what I'm saying? So in the, the real, we hate the police, we should hate the politician. You know what I'm saying? That's coming up, you know what I'm saying? All this, the right, finding so stuff, leaving stuff open, and all that type of stuff. We really should hate the politician. They should be like in, 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 in clothing, however you want to see it. You know what I'm saying? They the problem. Uh, and we done had this adversarial thing with police since the police came into being. The police first was formed to protect property. And who were the property? Us. So we've been running from the air since we knew them. You know what I'm saying? We've been running from the police. Black people been running from the police ever since they've been police. You know what I'm saying? They just got extra powers now. You know what I'm saying? They were the cave, the slave catchers, and all this other type of stuff. Uh, uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, you know, what you're saying is, is really say. important. But do you I, have a question there somewhere that you want to post to our panelists? I'm talking about they can comment off this comment. <laughs> all right. You know what I'm saying? Look. All right. Okay. And, and it's like every time we get any type of rights, they try to scale them back. 13, 14, 15 Amendment. Soon we get up, they try to scale them back. He talked about the uh, Reconstruction era. You know what I'm saying? Soon we got anything, South Carolina, they, they fixed the economy. They had an all-black uh, Congress and Senate. Then that's thing you know, uh, the Freedmen's Brewer, they killed, uh, they, 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 they raided that. You know what I'm saying? They killed that. They bring the soldiers back. Here we go, uh, uh, back again. And the only time I see in history that we ever got anything after a war, after the Civil War, we got civil rights. Every time it's a war, the Vietnam War, I mean, yeah, we so-called got 13, 14, 15 Amendment. After the Vietnam War, we so-called get civil rights. And that's what Dirty Harry was. Mm -hmm. They got tired of uh, the, the, the Miranda warnings. He ain't reading nobody no rights. He got tired of that. They got tired of, forget them having rights and protections. You know what I'm saying? So Dirty Harry, they was applauding. Yeah, go Dirty Harry. Yeah, I never liked them shows. And I ain't know why, but I never liked them. <laughs> or or the, uh, Tom Bronson, I never liked none of them. You know what I'm saying? So right. Sure. So soon we get anything, they try to scale it back. Voting rights, anything, anything. Y'all can have the flow. <laughs> right. Thank you. We're going to have you down here next time. Yes, sir. If I could read about it. Okay. Um, I just, this was a great, this last guy was just great. Um, and um, I, my question for the panelists is, um, I want each of, I would like each of you to tell us what you think is the most effective way to proceed from here today to affect social change and get you know less people in prison, you know have fair treatment of. People of color. I, I, as I sit here, I'm, I'm 68 years old. Uh, I've been reading about this stuff and seeing this stuff and living this stuff for a long time. Um, I, I would like to be. I would like to leave here with just, you know, a smidgen of optimism. Um, I'm, I'm listening to you, sir, and you're talking about. Um, is it different? Uh, isn't it the same old, same old as it was during Reconstruction as it is now? Um, I, I have read your magazine and uh, was a, I'm a periodic member of your organization. I remember the, the notorious, you know, and another Negro was lynched today poster. Uh, is what is going on in our black community in Milwaukee any different than lynching somebody except that instead of killing the person, you're killing their spirit and their will. Maybe that's worse in some ways. So I, I rely on you people that are younger than I am to kind of prop me up as I'm leaving here today. Solutions. Ms. Hall? I, I'm just, a, I'm a journalist, not an activist. So what we do in journalism is to try to bring forward information in the form of stories, but information and data and real life stories to tell people the way things are with the idea that if they are not in a way they, that they should be, that people will 
take those stories and that information to heart and then activists or other people, lawmakers, whomever, will use that information, will help make them make better decisions and recognize problems that they didn't, may or may not know existed or they may not have understood the uh, origins of a problem or the size of the problem or the shape of it or the root causes. That's kind of what I do. Uh, and and so that's my, my solution is to try to tell those types of stories so people understand what's it like to be in solitary confinement for 28 years. Not great, I'll tell you that. You know, what, what happens when you start denying parole to so many people? You know, those are the stories that I tell. And that, that's how I affect change in a certain way, is just helping people be better informed so that they can make better decisions about whether we're headed in the right direction or not. So as, as that activist, and I look at uh, the opportunity is uh, the greatest social program is a job, right? During the Depression, everybody had to find meaning, and that meaning was found through various activities, whether it was drawing portraits or writing articles or planting trees. American politicians found a way to get the American public back engaged in meaningful activity. That's what our city needs for our young African American uh, that have been unemployed for 40 years, that have been uh, in poverty for 40 years, and it's just not up to the government. I think our anchor institutions like our major health care systems need to get engaged also. Uh, so when we look at the opportunities, if I was the mayor and I had just offered Waukesha water rights, they would have given me the right to a transportation system to job opportunities. I didn't, I, I hope I didn't um, overreach <laughs> with my effort to draw on historical continuities because I, I do want to make sure to, to highlight that there are certain very important distinctions across uh, time and eras and whatnot. The, the similarities, though, are just too striking and too profound not to highlight. Uh, and unfortunately, the historical rec record, if it serves as a predictor, teaches us that things have to get significantly worse before they improve. And while things are pretty bad now, I'm like, things are pretty bad now, but they can get worse. And the the place or positioning of worse is is hard to predict. But at the same time today, uh, I am uh, encouraged by the demands of all of the folks who I, who I count as activists. I'm encouraged by the work of scholars, many of whom that I worked with 15, 20 years ago would have never walked out on some of the platforms they're walking out on now because of the over-professionalization of the, of the academic world. And when you're, when you're encountering these disturbing parallels, it's hard to sit in your office and pretend like that historical information or that sociological information or whatever your public health, that that doesn't have really relevant meaning. Never before uh, in the short time that I've been a historian has been a historian been so significant. Yeah. You know? I mean, the, the, the act and the search and the demanding of truth is as important of a statement of activism today as being in the streets protesting. It is multi-pronged. It has to be multi-pronged. No question about that. And there are a lot of people doing a lot of great stuff. And we, we, it, we have to continue. We have to continue. Thank you, Walter. Yeah, just uh, thank you, everybody. I, I'm uh, Walter Lanier, Director of Multicultural Services and community engagement here. And uh, uh, Dr. Smith spoke to the, the hope piece, so I won't put on my pastoral hat. Uh, well, maybe well, I will for you. need it. <laughs> <laughs> I am hopeful uh, by the room and the amount of engagement and the focus that is here 
uh, in the seriousness of all that are participating, and then drawing on the thread that uh, Fred said about our um, bedrock institutions, I think use another adjective. Uh, this is a bit self-serving, uh, but one of the most dynamic institutions that has not yet fully reached its potential in terms of civic engagement, dynamism, and having an even greater impact on the community is, is right where we are right now. Bravo. The largest percentage <laughs> of students of color yep. in the state, and really people of color in the state are right here in these two buildings. Dr. Burrell, one of my mentors, used to say this is the most diverse building in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And right here at Milwaukee Area Technical College, we've got a rich opportunity to engage deeper, uh, more passionately, more aggressively, and have a lot of energy, intellect, history, discussion, and action flow from outside, inside, outside, into these walls. Very powerful time for us as an institution. Uh, very excited for us as an institution. We just got a grant. Uh, I just saw it in my email today, so I'm kind of doubly excited uh, for $10,000 from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement uh, to do some of this work here. So this intersection of, of academics uh, and community in this space, uh, as we energize this space and do more in this space, I think we have a unique role uh, to have impact on our not only our community, but other communities as well. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about this room. And like any good preacher, I know how to make my exit, so you all have <laughs> <laughs> uh, We have a f uh, time for a few more questions. Art? Yes, in uh, organizing and publicizing this panel, I got two very direct responses, which I relate to each other, but they're in some tension. One was, uh, why don't uh, panels like this ever have a conservative on them? And I responded by saying, we pick people based on their expertise and experience, not on their politics. For better or for worse, that's what I told them. And uh, the other was a uh, very direct question, how can we make this issue effectively uh, in the uh, gubernatorial race that's coming up? How can we present this and make some impact in the governor's race? Any comments? Uh, yeah. all, you all have Wisconsin roots, so. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that. You know, the first of all, uh, I'm not sure how we use the term conservative today uh, because I'm not particularly impressed with Republicans or Democrats. Mm -hmm. So, uh, especially when we think about this particular issue and the way that it, it emerged over time and the Somehow, the, yeah, the, the slow and deliberate pace of change on this issue, despite everybody understanding the, 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 the broad range of problems associated with it. And I will just say this. At this moment in history, you can be conservative, liberal. You can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. And I'm not a, uh, uh, a, a person that gets into these kinds of uh, elusive ideas. As, you know, as an academic, you just want precision. But... If you're not on the side of justice, I could care less what your political leanings are. If you're a conservative and you find it problematic that somebody is critiquing this system, I got another word for you. I wanted to put a shout out in for the Wisconsin Policy Research Institute, which is a generally conservative free market organization. They have done some really good work on Wisconsin's uh, large uh, rate of inca incarceration and the, op and the um, opportunities to reduce that. And I will throw out there that the Koch brothers also think we're locking up too many people, just in case you think that the conservatives are not listening. Uh, is they're very yeah. they're mo they're motivated in part by money, <laughs> but that's that's Can what. I, go ahead. Please jump in. Uh, I just want to say so, one is this on um, one thing about maybe it's sort of bridging these different things. First of all, I think we always have to be clear about what the nature of the conversation is. Like, are we trying to? I mean, my understanding of this thing was trying to under, people who are working and thinking about this trying to build. Um, a community to push forward on a particular agenda, which is maybe different than a kind of than a than a than a policy than a than a, than a um, and and I think that I've been on a lot of um, panels with the Right on Crime, and I think it's actually a real. Sometimes these organizations are called Right on Crime, and so I actually do think it can be a helpful and really interesting, um, and poten potentially 
potentially politically rewarding um, set of alliances. My, what I, I, speaking of narratives and my sort of emphaticness on narratives, I, there's one issue I think is always important to say when we talk about that, which is very often that alliance comes together, especially at the sort of base pop political interest level around saving money. And I think that this is a place where, we, where if, if this issue um, moves forward solely on the base of saving money, um, I think we are, on, we are starting off on the wrong foot. In the sense that I want money, when we're talking about this issue, of like how do we move forward? I want money out of the criminal justice system, but I think that there, I don't, um, I don't ascribe to the, that this is actually some of the solutions to really deal with the social problems that the criminal justice system is now being employed to deal with in various ways. Um, are going to actually be maybe even be more expensive. Like so, for instance, job. I mean, like when we talk about the economic abandonment that's happened in many areas, um, I think we need to recognize that this isn't all about. I mean, this isn't about cutting, um, you know, cutting costs. Which is not to say that we don't that there's not a lot to be gained by building. And maybe this is a way in the in the with the gubernatorial election. There really is some value in building this sort of right on crime coalition. Um, but it, it, there are some tension, there are some real tensions uh, in that in that coalition. Well, you know, actually, we're out of time. Uh, but I'm going to give uh, you an opportunity to have the uh, last word. And we'll come back to you a little later. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. If you could be brief. First, I want to answer, try to answer Art's question. Um, historically, uh, well, the, art, the answer to Art's question is the Southern strategy. Yeah. Now, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the country. Of course, we had the built-in con contradiction of the Declaration of Independence stating that all men are created equal, but then the Constitution accommodating slavery, which is a fundamental contra contradiction in itself. What happened in, 19, in 1876 in the North Carolina electoral group, electoral college uh, delegates, was they got bribed by a promise of removing or ending Reconstruction. And so they voted for, instead of voting for the uh, candidate from New York, uh, they voted for Hayes. And Hayes became president, pulled all the troops out of the South, and ended Reconstruction. Now, I think what happened after 64, 1964, is of comparable importance. The embracing by the Republican Party of the so-called Southern strategy to lure all of the Jim Crow Southern, formerly Democrat Dixiecrats, to lure them to the Republican Party after the landslide loss with Goldwater against LBJ in 64. And that has held true. I associate the welfare queen phrase with Ronald Reagan. And let me tell you a short story about Reagan, which tells me all I ever needed to know about Ronald Reagan. In August of 1980, when he was campaigning, he went to Philadelphia, Mississippi, which was the place where the Klan killed uh, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, the three civil rights workers, and uh, they th killed him and left him out in the swamp. And Ronald Reagan, 15 years later, came back and gave a speech in Philadelphia, Mississippi, in favor of states' rights, which everybody knew was code for Jim Crow. That's all. And then in 88, they used Willie Horton against Dukakis. They've employed, the Republican Party has employed racial politics, racist politics, ever since. And the ultimate uh, pinnacle of that is Donald Trump and his racist campaign. So we need to oppose these efforts to call them out and expose them, because it's unacceptable in this country. Thank you. We're really out of time. I'm getting yeah, real quickly. Uh, we should just, I think we should form the. Turn on your mic. I just think we should form the, the movement as to, to humanize uh, mass incarceration and every, just, you know, to like, to humanize it. And what he said about lynching, every time I see it, hear a police kill somebody and it might be unjust. I feel like they felt when they seen somebody lynched. Every time. So it's an impression after impression after impression. So every time we get stopped by our police, we very scared. You know what I'm saying? Right, here go your ID, my hands out the window, sir, sir, sir. I'm saying, so it's, it, it's an impression. They just keep killing us. Right. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank all of you for being here uh, this afternoon. Let, let me just say this. I think we accomplished at least uh, the first step towards realizing a solution to this problem. 
We've engaged all of you. You've made some very, very good suggestions. You've informed our thinking uh, going forward in terms of the kinds of strategies we might want to employ. So I want to thank all of our uh, panelists and our guests for being here today. Thank all of you. And uh, for all of you who want to be part of the solution, please let us know how to contact you. So drop us your card, write it on a piece of paper. We want you to be part of the solution. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. An MCM production.